I'll come up when you... Yeah, yeah I'll just give you a, two minute, a one minute intro. Good morning, everyone. Uh, although I've got to say, um, atrocious morning, everyone. Might, have, might be a more appropriate way to uh, introduce ourselves because um, thank you, everyone, for kept coming out on what's obviously been a, a, um, a very torrid morning in terms of weather conditions. So thank you all for, for, for um, still, um, uh, still coming along. My name's Kevin Fuster and I'm the um, chairman of the Greenwich Society. Uh, and I'd have to say, wearing a previous other hat, it's nice to be back here at, at the National Maritime Museum's lecture theatre. And uh, I'd like to thank Royal Museum's Greenwich for making the theatre available to the Society for this, our annual lecture. Our speaker this morning is Rachel Morley. Rachel is the director of the Friends of Friendless Churches, which is an independent charity established in 1957 that protects and supports some 60 churches of architectural and historic importance across England and Wales which have fallen out of ecclesiastical usage. Rachel took her first degree in process and chemical engineering followed by a postgrad course in building conservation and repair at Trinity College in Dublin. She was a guardian and a trustee of the Society for the Protection of Ancient Buildings for some six years and is a judge in the John Betjeman Award for Church Conservation. She's perhaps best known uh, as a regular contributor to the popular podcast, The Rest is History. And I was listening to that before I came this morning. And I think today we're getting the illustrated version of, of, of a talk that you gave, uh, uh, that you've given in the past on the, uh, on, to the... Um, to that Rest of History podcast. So will you please join me in welcoming um, Rachel Morley to speak to us. Rachel. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you so much for coming, um, especially on such a wet morning like today. Um, I should say, this is a version of my top 10 churches um, that I uh, gave for the Rest of History podcast, but I have changed it up just a little bit. So if anybody's heard that, there would be a couple of surprises in here. Um, because there are so many churches, um, you know, I could, I could mix up the top 10, you know, every other day of the week. So to get started, I suppose, um, you know, to, to choose top 10 churches is a huge responsibility. And I hope I'm going to do it justice. And I think um, the top 10, the top 100, the top 1,000 churches has sort of been done to death. There's obviously, oops, I shouldn't go like that. There's obviously the giant of the topic, John Betjeman, who did his thousand best British churches in 1958. And Alec Clifton Taylor had a go. Simon Jenkins took the theme and gave us a thousand best churches in England only. There's the nation's favourite churches, Wales's top 100 churches. There was a campaign to find the nation's favourite church. And then during lockdown, one Twitter user launched a World Cup of Great English Churches. So, you know, it's sort of been sort of well-trodden ground, I suppose. So the winner of that uh, World Cup of Great English Churches was St. Wolfram's Grantham in Lincolnshire. Sorry, I'm not sure why it's moving on. But uh, Grantham was the haunt of Isaac Newton, Margaret Thatcher, and even me for a couple of years. Um, but St. Wolfram's, it is an excellent church, but it won't be on my list today. But this won't be the last you hear of Isaac Newton. So how do you go about compiling the top 10? Do you go for the oldest? Do you go for the most complete medieval interior? The one with the tallest spire? The long, one with the longest nave? The one that's been least restored? The one with the finest perpendicular arcade? The one with the best monuments? The one with the best saint credentials? Or do you take your list from ones that have these aspirations, you know, the ones that are like the Queen of the Moors, the Cathedral of the Marshes? But the fact is, if you do it that way, you always come out with familiar faces. You'll see Walpole St. Peter's, St. Mary's Redcliffe, Ludlow, Roslyn Chapel, Tenby, Fairford, Long Mel Mel Melford, Burford, Selby. All of these ones keep coming up and up and up, up and up and up. So, there are about 16,000 Anglican churches in England alone. There are 3,200 in Wales, 330-ish in Scotland, and 450 in Northern Ireland. So there's a huge variety of buildings out there. 
So rather than wheel out all of the usual suspects, I thought I'd pick ones that combine great architecture, art, but also tell really good stories. Because uh, old churches aren't like old castles and pubs. They're the spiritual investment of generations. And not only are they the spiritual investment, but they're also the artistic investment. And they're, this, they're these sites of shared, like concentration of shared human experience. And they're wonderful for that. So in these places, you can hear centuries of faith in cold stone and feel the slow passing of time. Not only can you hear it and feel it, you can actually see it like in the porch step worn down by countless faithful feet. You can see it in greasy monuments, uh, marks on monuments that people have touched time and time again, either out of devotion or mindlessness, or just because they like the way, how it, they, they like the way it feels. You can see it in graffiti, some holy, some irreverent, some symbols of a bygone age that we just cannot understand or reach anymore. You can see it in the hassocks lovingly stitched by someone's hands and worn threadbare by their praying knees. So my choice of churches will be unusual, but hopefully through the examples, I'll demonstrate what a church is and not just what a church is made of, to paraphrase from the chron Chronicles of Narnia, chron uh, paraphrased quite badly. So to begin, I want to go to North Wales. Not to Carnarvon, this is a fantastic church, but it's not on my list, but just to give you an example. Yeah. But uh, we will start here in North Wales, in Llanfrothen. So we start here in this place in kind of, it's on an estuary surrounded by hills, really kind of remote and overgrown. But here, a North Walian quarryman changed the course of history after his death. So Robert Roberts died in April 1888, and he had one final wish on his death. He wanted to be buried next to his daughter. He wanted to be buried in his local churchyard at Llanfrothen. That's all very well, but Robert Roberts wasn't a member of the established church. He was a nonconformist, and that's where the trouble began. Because a few years earlier, Parliament had passed a law that allowed burials of nonconformists in their local churchyards. But here, the vicar at Llanfrothen, he didn't like this because it would result in a loss of income for him. So, because he wouldn't have to give the service and the nonconformist vicar could. So he didn't like it, it would the vicar didn't like it, it would result in a loss of income for him. So what they did was a neighbor donated some land to the church with the conveyance that any burials had to take place under the practice of the established church. So the scene was set for a clash and the burial of Robert Roberts was the catalyst. So Robert Roberts, North Whaley Quarryman, wanted to be buried here, but Richard Jones, the vicar, wouldn't allow it. He wouldn't allow it unless it would be, the burial would be carried out under the rights and customs of the Church of England. But his family sought help. So enter a newly qualified solicitor, one David Lloyd George, aged just 25. He took up the case and he advised the family to defy the vicar and bury Robert Roberts next to his daughter. Together, they broke open the gate, and by the light of candles and lanterns, they buried Roberts where he wished to lie. This is his grave here. But the diocese brought a charge of uh, trespass, damage, and burying a corpse without proper authority. The, court, the case was heard in Porth Maddock County Court, and the jury found in favour of the defendants. But the judge ruled in favour of the church. Lloyd George, as the family solicitor, uh, appealed the ruling, and in the High Court, Lord Justice Coleridge overturned the verdict so Robert Roberts could stay buried next to his daughter. So this verdict absolutely propelled Lord George to, uh, Lloyd George to prominence, and no doubt contributed significantly, significantly towards his nomination to the Liberal uh, Parliamentary candidate for Carnarvon, which he won in 1890. And the rest, they say, is history. Lloyd George went on to become of the one, of most, one of the most famous liberal politicians in British history, a key figure in reform, laying the foundation for the welfare state. He was prime minister during and after the First World War. 
and the hostility aroused by the actions of the vicar, Reverend Richard Jones at Llanfrothen, also increased mom uh, momentum for the establishment of the church in Wales. And that was an important change to separate Anglicanism in Wales from the Church of England and assert Welsh national and linguistic identity. And that finally took place in 1920. But beyond all of that, Llanfrothen is an amazing church. It's dedicated to St. Brothen, who was a 6th century saint who built his, his cell on uh, the shore of an estuary. The, the site slopes downwards, so it's higher at the east end than at the west end, which would have been washed by the water of the estuary. The walls of this church, so the oldest surviving parts of this church, are 13th century, but for me, the most amazing part of this is the roof, which was dendro dated to 1496. It's got these beautiful diamond trusses, um, lovely sort of bat wing braces. It's an enormous roof. Uh, it's got uh, about over 14,000 slates on the roof. Um, it's got rude screen frag fragments. It's got like nice old fonts and bits of pews and monuments and all that. So it's a fantastic church, even despite the Lloyd George connection. But if prime ministers are your thing, and we might have had enough of prime ministers recently, but um, if prime ministers are your thing, you don't have to go very far to uh, get another connection. So this is a Gladstone's uh, memorial window at Hawarden in Flintshire. So Gladstone married Catherine Glynn here in 1839, and a, uh, uh, an, a guest at the wedding describes uh, the church as being crammed to suffocation with females. But there's a memorial window to Gladstone here, um, and it is by Byrne Jones, who was Gladstone's, a very good friend of Gladstone's. I kind of, I wouldn't have kind of put the two of them together, but so there we go. Um, but it's a really beautiful nativity scene, kind of framed by these angels, and I love how the Virgin's kind of body is curved around the, the child. It's a beautiful window, um, and Gladstone made um, Byrne Jones a baronet, who was the first ever artist to have that honour. So, church number one. Llanfrothen in Gwynedd. I should say, I'm not counting down or counting up. It's just a random assortment of churches. Sorry, mightn't uh, uh, ju just put that out there now in case you're hoping for a, kind of a big reveal at the end of the top church. So, this one wasn't on the podcast. So this is a new one, a new entry, but it's not this church. So, Greenwich has given the world so much Obviously, it's famed for its rich maritime history, its architecture, its major role in the history of astronomy and navigation, and of course, for being the birthplace of several high-profile Tudor, uh, high Tudor monarchs. But it also lends its name to armour. So Henry VIII was obsessed with the image of the knight. This armour offered protection, it was fashion, it was theatre, it was romance, and he loved the sculptural, decorative armour of Maximilian, Holy Roman Emperor. So he modelled himself as a Renaissance king, on Maximilian. He recruited Flemish and German armourers and established a royal armoury close to the Palace of Placentia at Greenwich. They made armour almost exclusively for Henry, so it was this blued steel, it was acid etched designs, fire gilding, and some even believe that the armour was, uh, the designs on the armour were um, created by court painter Hans Holbein. When Henry died, Elizabeth I took this, this Greenwich armour to uh, to create kind of the nub of her chivalric cult. So she sold armour licences to her courtiers who wanted to outdo each other in their glamour and devotion. But ordinary Englishmen didn't wear Greenwich armour. Very little common English armour survives, but here in Suffolk, over a, uh, over a church porch, there's this little tiny timber panelled room. And this is the village's armoury. So inside there are, there are 23 pieces of armour and weapons, uh, but there are four complete sets of armour and yes, this random assortment of, 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 of weapons and it survives from 1588, the Spanish Armada. So when villagers gathered what they could in preparation to fight. And it, so very, very little uh, English armour, common armour, uh, worn by com common, common uh, soldiers, survives. But this little church um, preserves it over its porch, which is fantastic. However, funeral monuments uh, in unassuming country churches everywhere record the development of armour in England. And the attention to detail in many is really outstanding, from ribbit rivets to ribbits, from rivets to ribbons. 
So one of my favourite examples is in uh, a church in Redgrave in Suffolk, and this is my second church. So here there is a really um, a large 17th century effigy to Sir Nicholas and Lady Anne Bacon. Sir Nicholas was a courtier, he was a member of parliament and the first man to be created a baronet by James I. The figures are carved from white marble and the sculptor was Nicholas Stone who would later be the master mason to both James I and Charles I. But really I think this monument is, is, is it's, 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 it will, it's exquisite. Stone, he achieves, the sculptor achieves such incredible movement in the soft folds of Lady Anne's, uh, her dress. It appears weighty, but also weightless. There's the brocade and the lace detail. It's intricate, but it's also sumptuous. And the fluidity of the material is in stark contrast to her husband's full plate armour. So Sir Nicholas's armour resembles the style which emanated in the royal workshops at Greenwich. The pauldrons and the helmet show particular traits of the Greenwich style, and in particular the way in which the plates are arranged and modelled. Whether the sculptor Nicholas Stone actually based this on one of Sir Nicholas's own, own armours is, uh, is uncertain, but what is certain is Stone's attention to detail. Every clasp and every rivet, it's so, it's so well observed that a fully functional suit of armour could be replicated from this sculpture. So Sir Nicholas died in 1624, and by this time the fires at the Greenwich Armouries were already starting to die. Plate armour fell out of fashion in the mid-17th century with the advent of firearms, so armour had to become thicker to protect the wearer. So Sir Nicholas here is a final flourishing of that enduring image of the invincible, heroic, armoured English knight. That's church two. Okay. It's quite different from a, from a knight, but we're staying in the 17th century. But we're going this time to Hereford, so from Suffolk to Hereford. So, so here, uh, Francis Godwin was the Bishop of Hereford, and he was living next to the church at Whitbourne. And it was here, while he was living next to this little church, he wrote the world's first science fiction novel, The Man in the Moon. And in it, he tells the story of a Spanish man called Domingo Gonzalez, who's stranded on an island. And in order to escape, you can see on the kind of far picture, so that's the island he's trapped on, and to escape, he, I mean, there are lots of boats around him, I don't know why he couldn't uh, kind of call on one of them, but anyway, he decides that in order to escape, he needs to train a flock of swans to fly him to the moon, and that is how he's going to escape. But while travelling, Domingo realises that Copernicus was right. The Earth is not the centre of the universe, and that the Earth revolves. He also describes gravity decades before Newton ever discovered it. So Godwin is buried in the churchyard at Whitbourne, and this is our next connection to Isaac Newton. So this isn't my second church, but this is just a bit of a segue. So we've got science fiction and gravity. From there, so speaking of Newton, we head from Hereford over to Rutland, to St. Peter and St. Paul's Market Overton. So Isaac Newton was very familiar with Market Overton because his mother was from here and he grew up um, uh, not far away at Woolsthorpe. So the church at Market Overton has many Saxon elements and in the 19th century, or sorry, not the 19th century, uh, it had many Saxon elements, but in the churchyard, a bronze Saxon water clock was discovered. And when it was discovered, Newton was apparently absolutely fascinated by this and it really kick-started his study of time and science. And if you can see here, it's not a great photo, but here, apparently Newton gave that sundial on the West Tower of St. Peter and Paul in thanks to the village um, for setting him on his journey. However, my third church is going to be this one, which is Kirkdale Minster in North Yorkshire. So both of those two churches are really only segueing to this main attraction. So above the plain Norman doorway here, you will find a spectacularly carved Saxon sundial with the longest inscription in Saxon English. And it reads, uh, and there is a uh, transcription of it -ish here. So Orm, the son of Gamal, bought St. Gregory's church when it was all utterly broke and fallen and caused it to be made anew from the ground to Christ and St. Gregory, 
in the days of King Edward and in the days of Earl Tosti. Haworth wrought me and brand the prior. So, what does all of this mean? From this, we can place the church in and about 1055, when Edward the Confessor was on the, the, um, was on the throne. That Tosti is better known as Tostig, and he was the brother of Harold Godwin, later King Harold. And that Tosti killed Gamal in the inscription, so the, the, the son of Orm, the son of Gamal, bought the church. So Tosti killed Gamal and was banished from England. He came back in 1066, but was killed in the Battle of Stamford Bridge. So that is a uh, connection to, uh, to King Harold in this little church in, um, in North Yorkshire. But the sundial was plastered over for about 700 years. It was only discovered in 1771. Um, and remarkably, it's actually, so this is carved on the back of an earlier grave slab, which dates from about the uh, 8th or 9th century. So even from this inscription, we do know that there was a much earlier uh, church on this site. Um, but it's great that the sundial has that evidence on the back. And maybe one thing just as... Um, uh, just as an aside, it has nothing to do with the church, but not far away from this church, there's a cave that a quarryman reopened in, by accident in 1821. And in, inside, he found lots of Stone Age tools, but also bizarrely bones from elephants, hippopotamuses, rhinoceroses, hyenas, bison, giant deer. Um, and it's apparently the most northerly location hippo bones have ever been found. But anyway, there we go. So, yeah. Okay, back to Wales. I do like Wales and I do work there quite a lot. So um, Wales will feature uh, quite heavily, probably. Uh, yeah. Anyway, so back to North Wales. So St. Baino is probably the most important saint in North Wales. And his, his name is actually a um, kind of a, a, a mutation of a Celtic word into Old Welsh. And it loosely means knowing cattle. So Baino means knowing cattle. And to this day, Baino is the patron saint of sick cattle and also children. I don't know what the connection is between children and cattle. But from that, you might imagine that Baino came from an agricultural background. But no, he was the grandson of a Powys prince in the 7th century. But he chose the monastic life over the monar monarchic. And he packed off to ban Bangor and became an abbot. So he was a very active missionary, and there are about 11 churches dedicated to him all across England and Wales, including one in Colbone in, in Somerset, which, as it happens, isn't on my list, but it is one of the smallest churches in, uh, in England. It can only hold about 16 people. So it's believed that the church is built on the site of Baino's cell, so he lived as a hermit in Somerset, kind of in the, in the early years of his uh, missionary. So... Baino died here at Clinog Far, and he was interred in the monastery chapel, but both the monastery and the chapel were apparently destroyed by Vikings in 978. But that's just a quick look inside, so it is a big kind of barn of a church. But across the road is St. Baino's Holy Well, and if you were dumped in these waters, you could be cured of epilepsy, rickets, and impotence. But to complete the treatment, after bathing in the waters of the well, you had to spend the night on St. Baino's tomb. And that was, a, uh, that was a common practice until the 18th century, until in 1856, the tomb was declared unsafe for people to be sleeping on it. So it was destroyed, but not Vikings, just Victorians this time. But Baino's great gift was the ability to raise people from the dead, including his niece, Winifred, who chose to become a nun and then had her head chopped off by her uh, jilted lover, which seems was um, a bit of an occupational hazard back in the day. So St. Winifred's Well in Flintshire is one of the most beautiful and popular holy wells in Britain, and it's known as the Lords of Wales, and even mentioned as one of the Seven Wonders of Wales. Going back to St. Baino, he was a very popular guy. So to get away from his pupils and his parishioners, he used to wade out into the middle of a river and kneel on a stone to pray. One night he was out there praying when one of his pupils called Alherne approached him. Incensed at being disturbed, Baino muttered that, you know, 
God should teach that man a lesson, or something fitting to a 7th century saint. Um, and at once, as he muttered that, wild animals burst through the woodland and they ripped poor Alhair and his student to pieces. Beno came over and he was horrified. He shooed away all of the animals and he looked at the dismembered body before him and then he recognised that it was his student, Alhairn. So, knowing that he can raise people from the dead, he dashed around the place, he collected all the little bits of Alhairn's body and he reassembled them and brought him back to life. But upon completion, he was very perturbed because he realised Alhairn was missing an eyebrow. So he searched around the woodland, trying to find something eyebrow-shaped. Didn't know what he could find, so he took the iron tip off his staff and fixed it to Alhairn's brow. And from then on, St. Al, uh, Saint Alhairn was known as Iron Eyebrow. So there we go. Uh, I don't know if that story is true. <laughs> um, but uh, St. Beno's Church on the site of Beno's Monastery in North Wales is really, it's a fantastic place. It's got these crocketed sedilia, it's this huge open space, it's got misery cords, monuments, it's got an ancient sundial in the churchyard, uh, and also something that I quite like, which are some Victorian dog tongs, which they, um, they display proudly in the nave. Okay, so moving on. So the fifth church on my list. So when most people think of churches, they think of Christmas. But a church in Yorkshire celebrates not only the coming of Christ, but also the coming of the turkey. So St. Andrew's Boynton is this gorgeous church. I was going to say but with turkeys everywhere, but I don't think the but is really necessary. It's a gorgeous church with turkeys everywhere, from lecterns to stained glass. And the reason is because William Strickland of Boynton brought the first turkey to Britain. In 1528, Strickland set sail to America to, uh, to seek his fortune. He went hoping for gold, but he came back with turkeys, six of them, and he bred them and he sold them. He made so much money from selling turkeys that he was able to build a country house in his native Boynton and Elizabeth I made him an MP. So in thanks for his success, he adopted the turkey as his personal symbol. So the book rest for lecterns is, uh, is, is the books are basically placed on turkey's feathers and it's the only turkey lectern in the world, I believe wouldn't probably be surprised. Um, for his coat of arms, again, he adopted the turkey and it's in the stained glass in the church. So he made a drawing um, of a turkey to illustrate what he wanted. And apparently this sketch is the first depiction of a turkey in Europe and it can still be seen in the College of Arms. But, have I got another? Oh, sorry. but as well as turkeys, the church is gorgeous. Externally, it's a stone box but uh, the interior is so much fun. It was redesigned by John Carr of York in the 18th century. It's got gorgeous green panelled pews, a commodious family pew, clustered columns and pilasters, plaster putty, swags, medallions, a flourish of a staircase leading up to a gallery, the mortuary chapel full of Strickland tombs and turkeys, um, and my favourite, which is a Norman tub font. Um, it has a lovely kind of green sheen to it. So that was just a quick one, and that was number five. So turkeys and Christmas. Okay. So from the magic of Christmas to the to magic in general and witchcraft, I suppose. I'm not sure how I could have make a seamless segue from turkeys to skeletons, but anyway, I'll uh, I'll try my best. So okay, next up is um, it's my sixth church, and I have a a few churches that kind of uh, lead the way into it. So um, I want to start here in Patricio, St. Issue Patricio in Monmouthshire. And on the west wall, you've got this painting of a skeleton. It's in kind of red uh, ochre, and uh, he's holding a, uh, uh, an hourglass, and he's got his spade, and I think he's got a kind of like a scythe in his, in his uh, right hand. So this is a medieval depiction of a skeleton, a memento mori. But legend has it that over decades, people have tried to whitewash this out. But every time, 
he keeps seeping through to the surface and keep re keeps reappearing, so they can't get rid of him. Not far away, uh, on the north wall of St. Michael's Cascob, there's an inscription from about 1700, and it says, O Lord Jesus, we beseech thee for thy mercy that this holy charm, abracadabra, may cure thy servant Elizabeth Lloyd from all evil sprites and from all their diseases. So I think it's funny that, there's, that they have a prayer, but they have just stuck in an abracadabra just to kind of hedge your bets, you know, um, uh, to, to, to see which one will, uh, will, will uh, save you from your evil sprites. But one such evil sprite could be Oh, sorry, that's just uh, the interior of Patricio uh, in Monmouthshire. It's a fantastic church uh, with a rude screen and lovely wall paintings and a wagon roof. But one such evil sprite could be Lilius AD. So witch, witchcraft uh, in Scotland, about 2,500 uh, mainly women were executed. And Lilius died in 1704. She was in prison after confessing to having sex with the devil. She was buried on the shore of Torrey, Fife, Torrey Bay in Fife in a coffin and under a massive slab of sandstone, and they feared that her spirit may return. It's the only known grave of a witch in Scotland, but her remains were dug up in the 19th century and her bones were sold off and made into things like walking sticks. Anyway, um, but bits of her bones have since been recovered but quite a lot, including her skull, are still missing. But this isn't a church. This is just to bring us to Scotland. So, here we go. Ein Hallow means Holy Isle in Old Norse. And it is an island between Orkney mainland, mainland and uh, Russi. So, according to legends, this island was once in the grip of a magic spell, and it was completely inaccessible to humans. But it was occupied by a mythical group called the Finn Folk, or the Finn Men. Humans did eventually make it over there, and just using salt and the sign of the cross, they were able to banish the Finn Folk, and they built a little church. For a long time, it was believed that the soil of Ain Hallow was so sacred, so powerful, that it could repel all desirables. So undesirables at the, at the time were rats and mice in your house. So there was a, a great market for getting fistfuls of soil from, uh, from Ein Hallow um, to keep mice and rats out of your home. But anyway, as I said, the name is derived from Norse. It means Holy Isle. And it's mentioned in the Orkney saga uh, under the year 1155. And there was once a Norse kirk on that island. And no one really knows when it ceased to be a church, probably sometime in the 16th century, and when it was converted into a two-story house. And it slipped out of memory until a chance discovery in 1851. At that time, a disease, probably typhoid, uh, ravaged the island and the four remaining families who lived there had to be evacuated. The roofs of their cottages were dismantled, and the structure of this ancient church was discovered. I think it's very interesting because it's never properly been, uh, been properly studied, um, and the traces of the, but the traces of the original Norse Kirk are still visible in the walls and in the gables. So, it is a significant, if poorly understood, example of a Norse religious house of unknown order, um, and it has lots of close parallels with Scotland and has, a, uh, has this um, uh, reputation for um, being able to banish mice and rats from your home. Okay, from... Uh, here we go again. So... This may be a tenuous, uh, this may be tenuous, but my next few choices are trying to draw on Greenwich's maritime and naval heritage. So the main body of a church has been called the nave in English since about the 1500s. Um, it's from the Latin navis, which means ship, ship. And of course, the ship is an early Christian symbol of the church, such as um, you know, the ship of St. Peter and Noah's Ark. But the term may also have been used to um, suggest the keel shape um, uh, of the vaulting of a church. 
So a literal interpretation of this is the star of the sea on Anglesey. So this is a, I mean, it's a fantastic interwar church. It was designed by an Italian architect, and it looks out over the Irish Sea, and it was designed to reflect the shape of an upturned hull, complete with porthole lights all along the bottom. Perhaps even more literal is the Tin Tabernacle in Kilburn. Before I go on to talk about this church, just a quick word on Tin Tabernacles in general. So corrugated iron was invented and patented in Britain in 1829, and it was a real technological innovation because it was strong, it was cheap, and it was easy to transport. You could order a prefab iron building uh, from a catalogue. Even Harrods sold them. So prefab churches developed around uh, in the mid-1800s, uh, and the first was built in London in 1855, and they were used to serve fast-growing industrial towns and cities all across England and the British Empire and North America. They were really popular until the First World War. There are only 86 tin tabernacles, or corrugated iron churches, remaining in England, and they are disappearing fast. But this one, St. James's Episcopalian Church, was built in 1863, and it seems like it was active until about the mid-1920s. It was used as, um, as a store during the air raid precautions in the Second World War, but in about 1949, it was taken over uh, by the Sea Cadets and renamed Training Ship Bister, following the practice of naming a training building after a decommissioned vessel to which the branch is linked. So... The Sea Cadets substantially altered the interior um, in the 1950s. They installed uh, this mock-up of a ton-class minesweeper vessel into the kind of main body of the church, which is it's a really extraordinary place to go and uh, things to see. It's got um, kind of lots of interesting bits of rope and... Um, <laughs> hooks. Um, but it is very interesting, even for somebody who knows nothing about um, boats, <laughs> like me. Um, however, they also have a small chapel inside, which is uh, very interesting. It's complete with plastic stained glass and a huge altar table. And it's really strange when you go in there, um, because they're all, the church is, um, they're all fittings from uh, all the fittings are props from the 1964 film Beckett uh, with Richard Burton and Peter O'Toole. So everything's a bit, a bit, bit strange in there. Nobody really knows how they ended up in there. Um, but, uh, but it does still have a little chapel um, and it has its little tiny little uh, holy baptism font as well. So that is number seven on my list, which is Kilburn's Tin Tabernacle. But actually, just one quick thing before I leave the nautical theme. So squeezed in between a modern housing estate on the edge of Crawley and the N25 is St. Nicholas's Church in Worth. So other than the, 18, the Tower of 1871, everything else dates between 950 and 980. And according to um, Pevsner, one of uh, the, the author of the Buildings of England series, it is one of the most beautiful set of Saxon arches left to us by the Saxon world, which is great. But what's probably even more interesting to most people is that Robert Whitehead, inventor of the torpedo, is buried in the churchyard. Now, Whitehead sold his first torpedoes to the Austrians. In 1912, Whitehead's granddaughter, Frances, was invited to christen a new submarine over in Austria. While there, she was introduced to the vessel's commander, George von Trapp, who she went on to man marry. In a short time, they had seven children, and when Francis um, Whitehead died of scarlet fever in 1924, von Trapp moved to Salzburg. He hired a nun called Maria to help with the children. They became the von Trapp family choir, and their story formed the basis of The Sound of Music. <laughs> so, there we go. Uh, Funny the links that kind of start to um, unravel as, as you look into these places. Next up is, many of you will be familiar with this chapel. Um, so this is the Italian chapel on Orkney. And it's formed of two Nissan huts. Um, and it was created by World War II Italian prisoners of war. So they were transported to the island of, Holy, uh, of Lamb Holm in Orkney. 
and they created a facade out of concrete and they concealed the shape of, um, of the hut behind and they made it look like a church. It's incredible because they used anything they had to hand. So the light holders were made out of corned beef tins, the baptismal font is made out of the inside of a car exhaust covered in concrete, and then consequently they, uh, they decorated the, the, the nave and the east end, and it's this really beautiful, elaborate design imitating brick and carved stone. Wales has a similar one. I'm sorry, I don't have a, a proper photo of it without a, a huge Royal Commission kind of stamp in the corner. Um, but Wales has one which is in uh, the Tyvee Valley, and it was which became the destination for 1,500 prisoners of war, mostly, again, Italian soldiers. They were uh, transported by rail to a purpose-built camp by the side of the river and put to work as agricultural uh, labourers to replace the local men who were off fighting. The prisoners requested that they could have a church and a corrugated Nissan hut, again, was cleared um, to create their place of worship. A young prisoner was enlisted to decorate the chapel, and he did so using just everyday materials that he had to hand, like vegetables, berries, tea, coffee, soot mixed with fishbone glue, and all of these, he created these frescoes going the whole way down, um, and he created a last supper. We could just about see it in the apps there. He painted a last supper above the altar. But number eight on my list is actually uh, this one, which is... From, it's in Hampshire, and it's a Santa Memorial Chapel, and it's a really modest red brick building from the outside, but inside it has this epic series of large-scale murals by Stanley Spencer. And it was built to honour the forgotten dead of the First World War, who are not remembered on any official memorials. Specifically, it was built to uh, memorialise Lieutenant Harry Sandham, and it was commissioned by his sister. But there are 19 paintings inside, and it's a really close, small, close space. And they're inspired by Spencer's own experiences as a medical orderly in Beaufort Hospital in Bristol, but also as a soldier on the Sol um, Salonica front. The paintings, I think, are just fantastic because they're peppered with everyday activities and unexpected personal details, and they don't really show the kind of... Um, kind of explicitly, the horrors of war. So Spencer was inspired by Giotto's chapel in Padua, and he described the Sandham Chapel as his holy box, and it took him six years to complete. But it starts with the gates of hell, and it opens... Sorry, that's, that's a lie. It starts with the gates opening into a Beaufort Hospital, which were as massive as the gates of hell. Spencer described them as. The scenes move through cleaning, ablutions, so sorting your kit bag, doing your laundry, filling tea urns, and there's a massive stretch showing the camp at Karasuli, where Spencer himself cooks rashers and a dog licks out of a free bentos tin. Just another one. Um, but I think, really, the resurrection at the East End is the most commanding. A carriage has broken down in the centre. The horses are toppled. It's really chaotic in the foreground. Dead men are crawling out of their graves. They pick up their crosses and they walk to a Christ figure in the centre. You can just about... He's just here. So they pick up their crosses. It's all this chaos. They pick up their crosses and they walk to the Christ figure in the centre, and they hand their crosses to him, and then they walk on, presumably to heaven, but behind the depiction is of the, the fields of watership down. I think what's interesting about this is, when it came to consecrate the chapel, several bishops said no. They objected to the imagery of showing horses and dogs as being resurrected, because animals don't have souls, apparently. So in the end, the Bishop of Guildford did the ceremony, but only if the animals in the resurrection scene could be covered over with sheets. So anyway, but I think um, if you ever get a chance, it's, it's in the care of the National Trust. Um, and it is, um, it's really one of the most moving places I think I've, I've, ever, I've ever been. Um, so yeah, definitely do go there if you, if you get a chance. Okay. 
So that was number eight, which is the Memorial Chapel. Okay. Um, this is one of my favourite churches, which is um, St. Bothalf's Hardham in, uh, in West Sussex. Um, and this is just what it looks like from the outside. You can see it's, you know, it, it, it's definitely pretty old with all of those arches. But inside, you've got some of the oldest wall paintings in the UK. They date to about 1100. So they're full of the Annunciation, the Massacre of the Innocents, Adam and Eve, George and the Infidels, the Flight into Egypt, Doom. Everything is there. It's all there. This is Adam. It's all there on the, on the side of a road in, Wessex, um, in, in West Sussex. And it is open every day, and it's definitely worth a visit. This is, um, I really like the depictions, particularly of Adam and Eve, um, because they're, um, they're kind of, they're really the main one of them at the tree uh, in the Garden of Eden. They are incredibly tall, but all of their, kind of the muscles and the sinews of all of their body are all kind of um, individually drawn out. And it's, uh, it's, it's really interesting. But when they're expelled from the Garden of Eden, on the next wall, you can see um, there's quite a funny depiction of Eve milking a cow with a bucket, and Adam is tiny, and he's up in a tree kind of behind her, and lots of people think, well, he's hiding because he doesn't want to do the work, but I'm sure he was picking fruit or something in the tree rather than just hiding. Um, a, another fantastic wall painting, again, which I would absolutely recommend, is um, St. Lawrence's Broughton in, in Buckinghamshire. It's just on the outskirts of Milton Keynes. Um, and really nothing can prepare you for what's inside here. It's mainly 15th century, but you've got these enormous George and the Dragon. You've got St. Dunstan, St. Helena. You've got a doom. You've got this warning to the blasphemers. Um, it's an amazing church, kind of just a riot of colour. Um, and it was discovered during a restoration in 1849. But all of these really just lead into saying that there's so much more that we need to be, that we need to discover in our, in our parish churches. So these paintings were only discovered in 2008, and this is in St. Caddox Clancarvin Clank uh, in the Vale of Glamorgan. And they were really just discovered by chance. They were getting some repairs done to a timber wall plate, and the builder said uh, a piece of um, paint fell off, and the builder noticed that there was some red paint behind, and they called in an expert to have a look. Um, and they have discovered some of the most um, incredible and probably some of the most important wall paintings, definitely in the UK and probably in, uh, in Europe. So George and the Dragon, he was under 20 coats of lime wash, um, but he, the conservators did such an amazing job at exposing him. But as well as, uh, as well as George and the Dragon, you've got uh, Death and the Gallant, which I think is unique. Um, and you've got these seven deadly sins, which are really in fantastic condition. And it is exactly like a comic book strip. So you've got this multi-headed beast. Um, you can just about see it here. So there's, there's a central um, kind of a, a central beast, and he's got these heads coming off, and he opens his jaws. And as he opens his jaws, each of the seven deadly sins is contained within them. So um, this is lost here. This one is one of my favourites, which is gluttony. Um, so you can see, you know, here he's got all of these big barrels of things to drink. But the, the demon is holding his head and forcing him to drink, and the buttons are popping off his jacket. Um, and he's just going on and on. But it's incredible that nobody had a clue that these were there and they all um, and that they've been um, it was been possible to, to uncover them um, as well as the said seven deadly sins you've also got the um, uh, seven acts of mercy which are not in as good condition but definitely the whole building is completely worth seeing because as well as the wall paintings you've got a 15th century rood screen a 15th century roof and bosses, a Norman font, a Norman stoop, and it's all on this ancient foundation connected to St. Caddock's Centre of Learning in South Wales. Oops. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. So number nine on my list was St. Caddock's Clancarvin in the Vale of Glamorgan. Okay, and number 10, which isn't the first or the last, it's just number 10 for the sake of counting. Um, 
but uh, it's in Shropshire, Shrewsbury in Shropshire, uh, which is one of my favourite places in the whole of England. Um, but the church is fantastic. It's this uh, old red sandstone building. It's got a 15th century carved roof. Uh, inside, it's got this amazing stained glass. It's a tree of Jesse. So here's Jesse down at the end sleeping, and then all of these are all his kind of family tree coming off him. Um, it dates to 1330 to 1350. Um, and it did come from a different church in Shrewsbury and was brought here. Um, but also, it's got lots of fantastic stained glass from 16th and 15th century stained glass from, from, the, uh, from the continent. But the reason, sorry, that's just my nephew. Um, but the reason, um, why, uh, the reason why I've chosen it is, obviously, it's got fantastic art and architecture, but it's also got, I think, a really brilliant story. Um, so Robert Cadman was an 18th century steeplejack and rope slider, and he performed many feats of daring by sliding or flying down a rope. So he performed the stunt all over England. For, in 1828, there is a... Uh, sorry, in 1728, um, there is a history of Dover that records he amused the people of Dover by flying across the harbour from the highest point of the cliff towards the lowest extremity of Snargate Street. Thousands were assembled from all parts to view the novel site. But he did come to Shrewsbury, he was from Shrewsbury, uh, and he, in 1739, he wanted to perform this feat of daring, which would be he connected a rope from the have I got a picture from the top of the steeple here, which is 68 meters high. So he connected a rope to the top of that, uh, and then the rope went from the top of the steeple across kind of the slope of the town, down across the river, and into um, a meadow on the other side of the river. So he started on the side of the meadow, and he climbed up the rope. And as he was doing, kind of going across the River Severn, he was performing all of these tricks all along the way. But when he got to the top, near the pinnacle up here, he put on a timber breastplate and it had a big groove down the centre of it. And he turned himself around and he threw himself, hurtled himself down along the rope, down to earth. And he was going to slide the whole way from the top of the spire, down across the rope, over the river, and land um, in the meadow on the other side but the rope broke and he fell to his death. So, he was buried in St. Mary's Church and there's a commemorative plaque with his memory still just on the outside wall. And it reads, let this, mon let this small monument record the name of Cadman and to the future time proclaim how by an attempt to fly from this high spire across the Sabrine stream, he did acquire his fatal end. It was not for want of skill or courage to perform the task that he fell. No, no, a faulty cord being drawn too tight hurried his soul on high to take her flight, which bid the body here good night. So, I hope I haven't fallen flat on my face by choosing these uh, top ten. Before I finish, I do want to say... There is so much that I haven't mentioned. Churches, there are so many more churches. You, anybody could cut this in a different way. So I haven't mentioned anything about Saxon fonts. I could have been talking about the 14th century triangle player. I could have been talking about tiny Normans in doorways in Kent. I could have been talking about rude screens, more rude screens. But really, this is just to show an example of the amazing buildings that we have here. Um, and, and how much they have to show us, how much we have to learn from them, uh, and also how much is still to be discovered. Um, so, thank you.
just know which. which. Ah, excellent. Oh, that's good. That's good. We've been, so we've been to the um, Irish, uh, to the to the Italian churches, the Orkneys. Back in the Orkneys, yeah. Which is pretty, pretty, pretty yeah. Close, close I feel lucky about the Suffolk one because um, so my one of my trustees is the vicar at Mendelsham, um, so um, so I got to, got to go up and, and see the armory, um, and it's amazing because it's still. I mean, anybody who's been there probably knows this, but. It's got the the door has the original 16th century lock and and everything kind of the key still works perfectly and everything it's it's brilliant. I'm sure there are many questions. We have time for a few. So are there questions for us? Can I just ask a little bit more about this? Hmm? Are any of those churches yours? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> they are. Sorry. Um, so the first one, Clanfrothen in Gwynedd, is uh, that is one of. That's one of ours. Um, that's the Lloyd George one, the first one I mentioned. Um, I have kind of put photos of them in elsewhere. Um, so uh, Llanfaglen, which is kind of one of the earlier ones, which, uh, which I brought up. And then uh, this is one of mine, one of mine, one of ours, um, Llangum Uchaf and Llanelio in Powys, um, which, which has these uh, with their root screens. So yes, so those are ours. Howardine. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's in so it's in it's in North Wales in Flintshire, Howarden in Wales, Saint Daniel's Howarden. Um, it's where he was married. So yeah. It's a good. It's a really good church. Yeah, sure. Um, so, um, so we take on churches that are no longer used for regular worship. So they are. Sorry, this might be very boring for a Sunday morning to be hearing about kind of um, ecclesiastical law, but um, uh, so they are no longer. Uh, they're, they're formally declared redundant. They are no longer parish churches, but they remain consecrated for worship. So they le they lose the legal effects of consecration but they remain consecrated for worship. So what that means is that they can't be used for weddings unless you get a special license and things like that. Um, so all of them remain consecrated and they can have up to six services a year. Um, that's under the kind of the transfer from the Church of England or the Catholic Church or whoever gives it to us. So they can have up to six a year. Um, so yes, so they are still used, but they're officially preserved as monuments, as architectural monuments. Um, but all of our, well, all of our, all of our church, it's possible to visit all of our churches every day of the year. I think about 85% of them are open daily, so you don't need to collect a key, you just let yourself in. Um, and they're used for kind of everything from occasional services, you know, private prayer, art exhibitions, concerts, and sticks. And and we do, yeah, exactly. So when they close and people don't really know, or, well, the, the kind of church body doesn't know what to do with them. Um, because, I mean, I guess one like this, it'd be difficult to turn it into a house or really do very... First, well, first of all, it's up the side of a mountain in Powys. Um, it's incredibly difficult to get to. Um, and, uh, again, no electricity, no running water. Maybe that's not kind of the end of the world. But um, you would... It, it's got lots of wall paintings, little fragments of wall paintings, at least, um, on the walls. So it'd be very difficult to kind of do anything with. So there are just these... There are just so many churches, and it's kind of like, well, there are just some that we can't really do anything with, just preserve them. Um, and uh, and that's, that's it, really. And the difference between you and the Church of St. Rose and Jack? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, he asked me that earlier. <laughs> um, uh, the difference is, um, so we were founded in 1957, and for the first 12 years of our life, we, um, we acquired some churches, but ultimately, we lobbied church and state to create a formal protective structure for, um, for saving important places of worship when they close. Um, and we gave various bits of evidence to various commissions, and that resulted in the creation of the CC Church Conservation Trust in 1969. I think um, the 
CCT is, a, we are so lucky as a country to have the CCT. Um, they're you know, funded by DCMS and the, the Church of England. They are Church of England only. Um, and I guess we felt that um, the church commissioners decide which buildings they take on. And there are always churches that fall through the cracks um, or are underappreciated. And, uh, and we kind of pick up, pick up what, uh, in England, we pick up what, what we think is, uh, is, is worthy enough to be saved. And I guess the other thing is we do work in Wales and they... Oh yeah, <laughs> those are dog tongs. So for cat, dog tongs for grabbing dogs if they ran into the chancel um, or the sa or into the sanctuary. Yeah, uh, yeah, but yeah, it it did it it's, it is funny that they're just kind of displayed on the on the wall of the church. Kind of. So yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So I want to please join me in the first of Thank you, Rachel, for, for being such a wonderful speaker. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.